Hey, and welcome to this episode of the Whole Health with Rob Carney podcast, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. So I know many of you have probably seen me on social media playing around with my wooden maces, my steel maces, and a lot of that has been inspired by our guest, Dr. Joey Cadena. So Dr. Joey is the creator of the Primal Flow wooden training mace and the Thorfit Hammer. So he's the one I've been doing the course with. He's really taught me everything I know about the mace. He is also the owner, CEO, and lead physical therapist at Physio Sports Institute in McAllen, Texas. He has a bachelor's degree of science in fine arts from Texas A&M University, Kingsville, a master's of science in physical therapy from Texas State University, and a doctorate degree in physical therapy from Shenandoah University. So Dr. Joey is a fellow of the American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapists. He's also a seventh degree black belt in Kempo Karate and has earned the rank in Jeet Kune Do and Judo. So for more information on Dr. Joey, you can check him out at primalflowmovement.com or his Instagram, Dr. Joey PT. As I said, he is a great guy. He's taught me a lot about the mace, a lot about movement in general, and we talk so much in this conversation lots of valuable knowledge about his journey how he got to where he is how to properly use a mace how to balance proper movement as many of us tend to have injuries and have trouble finding a balance in a really sustainable movement structure we go into different footwear and we just talk about health and fun stuff in general so i'm really excited for you to listen to this conversation sit back relax and enjoy the show Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest, Dr. Joey Cadena, the creator of Primal, Primal Flow, the wooden mace course that I've been really sharing on my Instagram, my social media. So, Dr. Joey, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for that awesome intro, uh, Rob. I appreciate it. And I can truly tell you that I've seen such wonderful growth in you from the program when you started with the mace and where you are now, I'm just so happy to see how well you're moving and how you're integrating the mace into your practice. So it's really cool to be on your show. Thank you, man. Yeah. And and I can definitely say that before I started your, your course here, I was very much an amateur still am still have a lot, a lot of room for growth. Um, But that being said, I think that this program has been essential for really honing the basics and the foundations. I think that's something that, it was very easy for me to look on Instagram and YouTube and kind of self-teach myself, which is something that I've done with weightlifting, which has caused me a lot of injuries. So at this point, where two years ago I torn a muscle in my in my back here, I decided, all right, this time I love the mace and I'm going to learn from someone who actually knows what they're talking about instead of hopping onto random YouTube videos and trying to teach myself. So first of all, thank you first and foremost for the program we're putting together. Wonderful. Yeah, it's definitely been a pleasure. And, you know, honestly, the, the availability of media like YouTube and things like that to learn new skills, it, it's so amazing. And we're in a time that it's just incredible. And I, I'm kind of going to laugh about this because I'm a little bit old school in the sense that I've been doing this uh, since the 80s, mm. uh, really dating myself. But um, <laughs> I grew up in a small town and I had aspirations to learn martial arts early on. And when you're in a small town, you have one option or two or no options. And actually we had one school, one martial arts school, and I just wasn't impressed with the style. It just wasn't for me, the one, the school that the art they were teaching. And, you know, of course, Black Belt Magazine is something that's really huge. I mean, they're like the, the main source for martial arts, at least, especially in the eighties. And, you go into the back of the magazine where the ads are and there was this one ad and it said, learn Kenpo karate from your home with this video correspondence course. And I thought, wow, you know, that was particularly an art that I was very, very interested in from uh, some movies and just I had what I had seen in magazines and things. And so I thought, wow, I want to learn this from video. How cool. And how old were you at that time? I was 17. Uh, yeah, cool. So it says, you know, send $5 for shipping for free preview video. (laughs) Okay, what do I have to lose? So I send in the mail. I get this videotape VHS, super old school, right? Pop it in there. And uh, the instruction was so thorough. I was so impressed. I thought I can can totally learn like this. And uh, the way the program was set up, it was so far ahead of its time because it's kind of what we're doing now with Zoom and everything else. Uh, what basically what happened was you would buy the content for the first level level in your first belt 
and you will learn all the material. It was very thoroughly taught. They showed you how to practice with a partner, how to do things, and then they show you how to set up your camera and you film yourself with a scripted test exactly the way it was supposed to be done. And then you mail off your test to them in California. Wow. And then they grade your test. They video themselves critiquing your movements, giving you tips, uh, correcting any mistakes. They mail it back to you. You wait like four weeks and then you get your critique in the mail and then you pop in to see if you're doing everything right or what you did wrong. And then you, you kept going like that. And uh, that's kind of how this whole thing started was in, in that experience of being able to learn something completely new and, and self-driven. Um, and now you can do it instantly. I mean, with Zoom, as we're in our classes, we're, we're doing the movements. You guys study on your own. We meet. We do the movements, I make fine tuning, and you immediately correct it. The difference back then was I had a whole month or more practicing wrong. <laughs> then you get your corrections and you're like, wow, I need to fix that now. Uh, but it, it, it was something that was ahead of its time. And uh, I can tell you it was so wonderful for me because as it evolved, as that program evolved, those instructors began uh, teaching live seminars around the country and then it created tournaments and it really grew into live interactive like in-person training but it started out that way and so just like you started with YouTube you know or whatever you were using Instagram uh, it, it's so popular today it is and I think that's one thing that I've really enjoyed about the course is having that basically instantaneous feedback i mean maybe you get back to me instantaneously or maybe a few hours at most so i think that's been an incredible part that as soon as i send the video to you i'm getting feedback and it's like you don't get that on youtube you don't get that on instagram it's something that obviously it's it's a whole different level of learning and obviously with the current situation that's going on where there is not as much in-person interaction this is as good as it gets in my opinion like you can't you can't do a much better job than what you're doing there, first of all. So kudos to you on really putting this great program together. And I, I want to dive more into your story. So you started when you were 17 with the uh, martial arts. So is that the beginning of all things health? And how did that progress to where you are today? I'd like to hear, hear the whole thing. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, that was the beginning. Uh, I was always into, you know, action movies and things like that. I mean, you see these great athletes, martial artists, and, and, and you know, stuntmen and doing some incredible things with their body, like uh, acrobatics and combative movement. And, and it really inspired me. Um, so starting in with the martial arts, I was able did, to- Did you grow up in Texas? I did. I grew up in a small town named Falfurrias okay. in South, South Texas, rural town. Um, so I was kind of the odd guy out. I wasn't out, you know, <laughs> fishing and hunting as much as I was studying martial arts on my own. And uh, but it was something that caught me right away it was like, wow, you know, it's amazing what people can move like and what things they can do with their body and how physically fit they can become. And uh, I found a way to figure that out with this program we, with the short, you know, resources were small. So I was able to find a way to have it happen. And eventually that did lead to like in-person study and all kinds of great things like that as the years went on. But it started out from that video of martial arts. Uh, then I, I ended up finding out that there was an instructor. He was an ex-military guy who moved into our town and he was teaching out of his home. He was teaching Bruce Lee's art of Jeet Kune Do. And so I thought, oh, wow, Bruce Lee. I mean, he's my main, this guy's my superstar hero uh, and I can learn from his art. And so I started some live classes there and it was kind of going back and forth between that. Um, as the years went on, I started to compete in the martial arts tournament circuit and uh, was doing very well on the self-defense circuit. I had won a couple of international championships and things like that in Long Beach, California. And uh, I wanted to learn to become a better athlete. And, you know, martial arts movement is great, but I thought I need to get into sports science. I need to learn about, you know, lifting weights properly, eating right. You know, how do I fuel my workouts with proper food and nutrition? So supplementation and things like that, so I can be a better competitor. Uh, so I started in a program, the um, International Sports Science Association or ISSA. They have an awesome certification program. And uh, I took that in, I believe that was around 97, I would say, and um, started to learn about actual sports science and, and application. And uh, along that way, as I was competing at some um, championships in Long Beach, 
I, I had a massive knee injury uh, training. I, I had gone for a tournament, did the tournament, and then of course the source for martial arts is California. And my lead instructor, my head instructor, uh, Grandmaster Chuck Sullivan, he was the fourth black belt in the United States. Uh, so one of the martial arts pioneers, I was training at a studio and uh, I just pivoted wrong. I didn't quite warm up right. I, and I pivoted wrong and I blew out my knee, tore my MCL, my meniscus, dislocated patella, the whole bit. I went big. I went really big. <laughs> and um, I was taught, you know, when you get injured, you're kind of in denial. I think everybody does this. They're like, oh, this is not so bad. I'm just going to put a brace on it. You know, even though we, I put we never do that. What are you talking I, about? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, I just kind of bandaged it up and borrowed a, a crutch from one of my good friends. And I flew back home to Texas. By the time I got back, my knee was massively swollen and bruised. And I, th I think I should probably get this checked out. <laughs> so this was almost 48 hours later. I, get, I finally break down and go to the ER and, and I have this massive injury. And that leads to a course of surgery and, and, and things like that over a year's time rehab. And, and more importantly, trying to figure out how do I get back to the competitive form I was in. Here I can hardly walk. I've had knee surgery. Um, I really didn't get rehab. The surgeon was like, well, you're a fitness trainer. You should know what to do. Go ahead and go for it. <laughs> you know, Just be careful. And I walked into my gym. We owned a small gym at the time with martial arts and gym uh, studio. And I just look at all the equipment and I'm like, what in the world do I do? Like, what is safe? What can I, can I and not do? And it was trial and error, like, whoa, that hurt. I'm not going to do that. This didn't hurt. I'm going to do a lot of this. And that kind of sparked my interest on physical therapy. It's, it, it, was, it was a time where I, I needed to get back to, you know, competing again. I mean, my passion was martial arts and um, I couldn't hardly, you know, train at all. Uh, so I started looking into what physical therapy was all about and how to rehab things. And um, I was training clients, physical, you know, fitness training clients with a friend of mine who was studying to be a doctor, an, an MD, and he told me, you should really, really look into physical therapy. You're so into this fitness thing. Uh, you really, really could go to the next level, becoming a physical therapist. And so I looked into what kind of degree that needed, you know, what took for the requirements. And uh, that started my journey into physical therapy. In 2006, I started um, with a master's of physical therapy, uh, emphasizing sports medicine and my personal studies. And in that time frame, PT naturally went doctorate. So I said, okay, well, man, I got to go to the doctorate program. I want to be up with everybody else. Plus, I love this material. I want to learn more. So enrolled in a doctorate program, and along that way, I met my really, really longtime mentor, Dr. Peter Kroon. He had a fellowship program, which is to become a specialist in, in movement and orthopedics. And that's another two and a half years and 400 hours of residency. So it's okay, here's the next part of my journey. I joined his fellowship program and did the residency. And uh, 12 years later, I've been a specialist in PT, and uh, still training and teaching in the martial arts and a seventh degree black belt. And um, along the way, I found the mace um, through this kind of crazy course of back and forth and improve your training and an injury here and rehab the injury. I found mace training as I was doing uh, Spartan obstacle course races. Uh, one of the big things for Spartan is grip strength and, and just overall muscle endurance. And I started looking into tools and ways to improve my grip strength besides rock climbing and, you know, specific training. And I found the mace online, saw some amazing athletes doing some cool stuff on Instagram. So just like you, I buy a mace. I find out even though I'm a martial artist and I can do the staff and I can do collie sticks and all these different weapons and things, the mace was very foreign. It felt so different. Um, a 10 pound steel mace felt like a 50 pound kettlebell, you know, and uh, it was very awkward and difficult to work with. And I was so inspired because it was such a challenge that I dive in and I took several of the programs that were online, learned in person for a bit from several instructors and, and uh, formulated primal flow. But along that way, I started to realize like, hey, this can be done really, really well with physical therapy. Like, I have some clients that have shoulder impingement or I had a, a client with a hip replacement surgery and I knew that the mace would be good for them. But I thought a steel mace, 10 pounds, that's a bit dangerous for someone that has an injury. 
So there's got to be a lightweight one out there. So I start to look up online, like lighter weight steel mace, training mace, something. I can't find anything. And just so happened that that weekend and that week that I had that mindset, I, was, I did a course. I took a course on the Japanese sword. Uh, it was a weekend course. I went over out of town, took it. And of course, when you're learning the sword, you're learning with the wooden tool, the Bakken. And that was a big aha moment for me for Primal Flow was like a wooden mace. If you learn the sword with a wooden sword, why not learn mace with a wooden mace? It's lighter. So right away, I put through some resources, started doing some research and designed the, the Primal Flow wooden mace, uh, much lighter weight version of the steel mace. And I thought in my mind, okay, this I can put in a, a patient's hand with a clear conscience that I can keep them safe. And, and that started the whole Primal Flow Mace movement was, hey, let's get a lightweight version of this. And I found it to become an actual full out art in itself because of its weight. You can do other things that you can't do with a steel mace. And that's kind of where we are now. Like to this day, that was like that full circle long journey uh, in a nutshell. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And I, I learned something. I mean, I know a bit about your background, but that definitely really filled in the gaps. So that was really cool to hear. And I can definitely say from my own experience, again, having that muscle tear on my back a couple of years ago, and that's where I was lifting a lot of weights. I was, I was a swimmer in high school. So I was a state swimmer. That was my sport. I was really good at swimming. And then I like rock climbing. So typically body weight activities is where my strengths were. Um, then I went out to LA of course, you start seeing some of those guys at Venice Beach, some of those big guys. And so, you know, I, I got to get my ego feels a little, a little, a little small there. So I start working out with my CEO of the company I was working with, who was the number three um, wrestler um, for ages 58 to 60. So he looked like Superman. So, so I started working out with him, put on about 20 pounds in four months, most of weight I've ever gained ever in one period of time. And then along that lines it was all go 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 do 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 and then not enough recovery and then the rest is history so over the past couple of years it's been a, trying to figure out how to heal this thing and it was about a year ago when i went out to the czech institute which is where i did my uh, holistic lifestyle coach training in san diego and one of the guys there had a steel mace and I was like, that looks pretty badass. Like, can I, can I, can I play with that? And he was like, oh yeah, sure, go for it. And so, as soon as I picked it up, I was like, all right, this is something I need to look into. And then a couple months later, of course, I'm looking at all their hundred bucks or expensive, and I was like, oh, screw it, this is this is a good investment. Yeah. So I bought the seal mace, was playing around with it, self-taught, and then again, probably six months later is when I found your course, and then that's when I was like, all right, this is the golden opportunity. This is a incredible deal well the guy actually at my check institute recommended you as one of the pages to follow so he was following you there um and so it all kind of came together and at that point too i was using the steel mace the seven pound and holding that thing it, as you said it feels like it's at least three to four times as heavy as it is and yeah. i often hand it to people like how much do you think this weighs and they're like eh, 20 pounds I'm like seven yeah so yeah but then even after that, using the steel mace to begin the course, and you kept saying, oh, you might want to consider the wooden mace. And of course, my first instinct is like, oh, he's just trying to sell me something because it's his. And that's yeah. it's funny because it's like that sales stigma that we have. Yeah. And as soon as you pointed out the little things, I was like, yeah, I can't get the full extension. And I became very mindful. And I was like, you know what? He's a professional. He knows what he's doing. Whether he's trying to sell me or not, I don't care. I'm going to get this thing. And it was one of the best decisions I've made. So that has been a complete game changer for me. So anyone listening, if you are considering, I highly, highly, highly recommend starting with the four and a half pound wooden mace, the Primal Flow wooden mace, because that thing is longer, it's lighter, and it just, the way that you can do, you can do more motions with that. And I remember with the steel, one of the, the, the big points was I was doing, I think it was, uh, um, I can't remember if it was, um, I can't remember, I was doing some motion. And I felt like a little uh in my shoulder. And I was like, you know, maybe it's because this thing is too heavy to be learning with. So right. that's where really using that, the wooden mace has been absolutely a game changer. Yeah, I mean, that was the entire mindset for making it. It's like, you don't ever, I mean, the perfect uh, analogy is you don't go into the gym and grab, you know, the barbell and load 45 pound plates on there without warming up. I mean, you start with something lighter, 
start to warm up, you work your way up on the weight or you don't grab a 50 pound kettlebell for your first swing. And, and the thing is that the steel mace, that's kind of the only option out there. I had the same problem. I, I bought a 10 pound mace and it sounds like nothing. You know, oh, 10 pound mace, sure. I mean, you don't even ever grab the 10 pound dumbbell to warm up with. You get, you know, the 20 or something. Uh, so I thought 10 pound, that should be really light and easy. And I get it. And I was like, wow, they mislabeled this thing. This is the 20 pound mace. <laughs> and I weigh it on the scale and I'm like, man, this is 10 pounds. Um, hmm. Okay. And so I'm trying to go through the poses that I'm seeing on Instagram. And then I, I can't even do them for very long. I'm gassed out. I lose my form and I knew there was a safety issue. And the biggest thing for me when I've taught martial arts for all these years is the foundation is where it's at your basics your your movement patterns if they're not locked down solid you're not going to ever get to be an advanced practitioner safely and um, you know olympic lifters they don't go and do an olympic lift on a barbell without starting with a pvc pipe you even see world champion olympia olympic athletes they're warming up with a pvc pipe and the steel mace was missing that equivalent and and uh Fortunately, unfortunately, I guess I filled that gap uh, in the sense that I had created that and um, I'm, I'm really grateful that I was able to do that. But it also, it creates that little thing like, well, is he selling us that wooden mace because, you know, he's the, the one creating it or is it truly because it's a good thing? And as a therapist, I, I try to say that, you know, you really need to start out light to get the right movement patterns. It just so happens I make the only lightweight mace out there that's scaled like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's what I really feel for safety and for movement acquisition. hundred percent. And I think it's also too, is going to go back to the sales stigmas. I mean, I share, um, organic nutrition products and people are like, Oh, is he just sharing these? Cause he gets a commission. Well, it's like, obviously that's part of why, cause I need to make money to live, but it's like, because I use these products every single day and I've seen the effect yeah. I've had on my health, my energy, my skin health, just overall vitality. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the steel mace is like, it works. And that's why you're sharing it. That's why you made it is because it works. Yes. And I think, as you said, it's so essential to start with the basics and the lightweights because today was one of the first times I started bench pressing again in months. So what I do, I, I did four reps of 20, 20 reps, four sets of 20 reps, just the bar, just focusing mm -hmm. on form, just slow. And again, my ego is like, dude, throw, throw some weight on there. But, but then my body is like, look, you know what happened last time. We don't want another muscle tear. We're yeah. in this long game. So let the ego go and just yeah. and just use the light weight. So as a therapist, a physical therapist, when you are recommending people use the mace, what is the best place to start? Like, should they start doing just some, some basic grip strength? There's kind of like switches or should they be doing some of the lunges or like what's the, the basic way to get started? Cause obviously grip strength is this, an essential part of not only physical strength, but overall health and vitality. There's a lot of studies that show the connection of grip strength to overall health. So where do people start? Let's say they have your, their, your wooden mace in their hand. Where do they start if they're not in your program, which they should be, but if they're not yet, what's a good way to just kind of play around with it? Oh, definitely. I mean, there is an absolute uh, integration of grip strength and health because if, if you can't, like say you're lifting weights too or swinging a kettlebell, if your grip is weak, you're going to lose that guy. You're going to lose your form. Right? It's going to fly out of your hands. Barbell, you know, a lot of times to deadlift. I mean, even looking at a leg workout or really deadlifts a total body workout, but we see it as a leg workout. If your grip is a weak factor on pulling the bar in your deadlift, then you're not really stimulating what your legs and your other body muscles can do because you're limited by grip strength and you can use straps of course but again that kind of perpetuates the weakness i'm about you know challenge that functional strength and build it up and when you go to the mace just like with all your workouts you want to have it um broken down by body regions so doing the lunges with the mace in different positions is important for your leg day you know, doing the different switches and the different, like the 360 swing and the mills is great for your upper body day. And as always, you should do a total body day. You can do something where you're mixing up your lower and upper body movements and really getting a full calorie burn. And, and that's one of the things I, I uh, wrote that's in an article coming out pretty soon for Paleo Magazine. It's about the structure of the weekly workout. And you nailed it when you said, you know, you got your barbell and you're like, oh, come on, man, put some weight on there. That's the mindset, unfortunately, of like 
everybody right now. It's like, how heavy do you lift? What's your PR? Or if you're a runner, you know, like how fast, what's your mile pace? And it's, that's good to achieve, you know, uh, it's tr try to achieve optimal performance and try to push yourself to be as optimal or as strong as you can be or as fast as you can be. That's great. But I think we're tipped on that other end of the bell curve where it's like all, all, all out, all hit, all heavy, all high intensity, run yourself to the ground every workout. And as a physical therapist, that keeps my practice pretty busy because I do get so many, you know, I, I see athletes all day long and 95% of them, it's their workout design that got them injured and into my office than like a freak accident or they just act, you know, they fell or something like that. It's, it's that mindset of an ego driven, I have to lift heavy, I have to run fast all the time. Mm. When, when actually like the, just to spout out a stat on you, the, the National Academy of Sports Medicine says 20% of your total workouts should be that hard, heavy, fast, high intensity workout, 20%. And for, for some people that's staggering, that's like 20%. The other 80% should be kind of moderate and even low intensity workouts. Uh, because really where it's at, the healing occurs on the recovery. The healing occurs on optimal movement and muscle recruitment. And then your high intensity go to a whole other level. I have a tough time um, as a PT when I get marathoners in, especially those guys, because they're like, yeah, I run about 70 miles a week or 80 miles a week. And I run six days a week. And, and I tell them, well, that's why you're here with the knee pain, or that's why you're here with your you know, tendonitis of some kind, tendinopathy. What if you only ran three days a week or four days a week and you did some mobility work and you did some muscle synergy, like functional movements, you're actually going to run faster. And I have to sell it to them. Yep. You look at me like, wait a minute, I'm going to get slow. I can't not, I can't run four days a week, but I, the ones that trust me, they end up PRing on their next race. They're in the, their paces get faster and they're blown away that they can actually become stronger and healthier by scaling it back a little bit. And that goes back to the lightweight mace. Same I think that the way I see it is the yin and the yang. And we're such a yang driven society. We're so do, do, do. And as you said, it's all fire, like more, 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 more. Yeah. But what I've found to be really effective over these past few months is especially where I've been doing a lot of gardening. So mm -hmm. gardening, that's, that's movement. So I'm moving, it's mobility. I'm raking, I'm shoveling, I'm cutting down trees, like whatever, not trees, dead branches. I'm not cutting down trees. <laughs> right. But, uh, but uh, so point being is that there's a lot of movement. So I'm moving a lot, but I'm only doing like a heavy strength training workout usually twice a week. Yeah. And that's what's worked for my body. Maybe for you, it's three times a week or four times yeah. a week. But the point is that for me, it's usually twice a week I'm doing like today was my strength training day. But I'll, mm -hmm. like later today, I'll do some gardening and do some, some light mace movement. And then I'll do some, maybe I'll do some yoga and some mace tomorrow. So it's really a matter, I think, of, first of all, listening to the body. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a very big challenge for a lot of people, as you said, who have this mindset where, again, I was one of those people who was just like, oh, I got to do, 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 lift, 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 push, push, push. But as you said, the, the growth happens in the healing. Yes. And I think that I see a lot of people that come to me as coaching clients that they're not sleeping and yeah. they're wondering why they have pain and inflammation. It's like, well, if you're not sleeping and you're not recovering, there's gonna, there's, there's there might be some correlation going on there. So yeah. when it comes to having a healthy body and you're doing some strength, because obviously strength is a very important part of overall health, but yes. what are some of the practices that you use? Like obviously mobility, do you do yoga? Like how do you have a well-rounded, approach to your physical fitness and physical health in general yeah that's that's a that's a great question and and the thing is that um there there are different categories of movement that what i call it calls primal fit like being primal fit if we look back to our ancestors i mean they had to crawl to hunt you know they had to climb they had to carry they had to lift they had to run they had to do all these different functional movements to survive you know, fast forward centuries later, and we sit at a desk on a computer, you know, 90% of the day, and then we go slam, a, a, you know, a high intensity hour long workout. Uh, meanwhile, our joint capsules are tight, our muscles are, you know, inhibited, and they're slow to respond. 
yeah, we want them to do sprints or box jumps or Olympic lifts and things like that. And, and we get injured, you know, there, there was a stat too, like our, our society now is less healthy than society was 20 years ago because of the, 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 the modernization and the more time sitting in our jobs. And even something as simple as footwear, stiff shoes, you know, has made our feet weak and the proprioception or the uh, neuromuscular awareness of our body is, is like covered up. And so we have to undo all these layers. And so there's, there, workout design should have movements that, uh, there's four categories, movements that inhibit those super active muscles. And what I mean by that is like, just right now we're sitting here doing our interview, right? Our hip flexor muscles are on to keep us sitting in the chair. They're not more buff or bigger, right, than any other muscle, but they're turned on 80, 90% of the day to keep our body sitting. When we go to stand, they don't know how to turn off because you have them on. And so your, your glute and your hamstrings, the muscles in your backside, those guys don't know how to turn on because when you're sitting, they're off. So you have to have muscle activities that inhibit those on muscles all the time. You have muscle activities that activate those that are always off. And then you have to have um, movements that integrate these things all together. And how does that work? There can be a lot of programs like in, in the Primal Flow program, I try to, I consciously categorize movements by those mindsets, like the bow and arrow movement, for example, you do your, you put your, your mace in a position like you're drawing a bow or you're drawing an arrow with a bow. And what you're doing right there is you're elongating that pec muscle, that chest muscle that's rounded on your phone and on your keyboard or driving. You extend and you open that up. And so you're inhibiting and lengthening that muscle. Then you're activating the muscles of your shoulder blade. When you pull back and you squeeze on that mace handle, you're turning on muscles that have been off because they're leaned forward while you're on your computer. Um, then when you stand up into a tree stance, right, a tree pose, you're on one leg while you're doing the bow. Now you're integrating all these things together. You're making your foot muscles keep your balance. You're making your hip and glute muscles control where your knee is so you don't fall over. And you're integrating and putting all these things together. So you've inhibited the muscles that are on. You've activated those muscles that are always off. And you've lengthened those tissues, right? There, there is an old school thought like I have to stretch more and that's really a, a thing I have to dispel often static stretching and things like that there's a good place for it but the reason why those muscles need to be stretched it's not because they're physically tighter like if you were to look under a microscope at their cells that muscle tissue isn't physically tighter it's just on it's mm. tenser and so you have to turn that guy off by activating the other guy the opposing muscle group so it's better to strengthen your weak guys than to lengthen your on guys. Totally. That becomes a much more functional way to optimize your body. So that's kind of the workout design. Yeah, I think that that's a very important mind or philosophy to look at it too, because I can say, again, from my experience, where when I was doing a lot of yoga, mm -hmm. a lot of vinyasa yoga, I was overstretching my hamstrings and I felt... I would feel bad. Like I would be sore for like three, four days. And like, at some point I was like, hold on. People say yoga is good for you. Yeah. You're supposed to stretch. But at some point it's like, when is too much? And I think that that's also, it comes back to that, that yang side of yoga. Like we've really turned a restorative practice into something that is really, it's over the top. And in my opinion, when I think about it logically, we are trying to lengthen and also strengthen at the same time. It doesn't really make sense when I really think about like, why are we lengthening a muscle, but then also trying to work it out in a lengthened state. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this weird dynamic that really took me some pain to recognize like, all right, maybe this is for some people, but this is not <laughs> meant for my body. And yeah. I think that what this whole movement concept comes down to is finding that balance and yes. really learning about the body. I mean, if you can see my background, I have this, muscle poster here so a lot of times if i feel oh i got some pain in the front of my shoulder oh maybe it's going down to my bicep maybe it's going into my neck and just kind of i i just am, i'm curious because i want to heal myself so if i find tightness like well maybe if i stretch or massage my bicep oh yeah that's starting to loosen up 
So, and as you said, it's not always about targeting the specific muscle, but it might be targeting the opposite muscle. Mm -hmm. So if one is having an issue, well, sometimes if your low back is tight, maybe it's because your abs are tight or vice versa. Exactly. And so I love that approach there. And I want to go back to your, your topic of footwear, because that is one that I'm a huge proponent of being barefoot. As you said, I see people wearing the worst shoes. I see their feet rolling over because their shoes are so just garbage. Like they should not be, they should be in the, in the trash can. Yeah. So I want to hear what is your thoughts on footwear? Cause I tend to go barefoot. I have Vivo barefoots or I have Chacos. And yeah. I, those are my, I kind of cycle between those three. What, what, what footwear are you wearing and what do you recommend for the average person? Yeah, totally. So just like strength training, our foot needs to be strength training. And that's the thing that this was where uh, the Vibram shoe, the five finger shoe got in a lot of trouble when they first came out was people bought them like crazy because it makes sense. Strengthen your foot. You should, you should have an ideal foot range of motion and strength. And people got plantar fasciitis, people got all these issues and they like attacked that company, poor company, right? They're doing a really great thing. They had the right mindset, but people jumped into them. So you can imagine, I mean, as we were kids, we grew up wearing stiff shoes. I mean, that's what was out there on the market. You know, the big major shoe companies are really restrictive shoes. They have a big, what you call a drop. That's the difference between the heel and the toe. And they have all this you know, other structures within the upper to stabilize and, you know, strengthen, not strengthen, but support your foot. So you wear that for maybe 20 years, or if you're in a professional position and you're wearing like a dress shoe with a heel on it, you have to wear that or women, you know, a high heel, that kind of thing. Um, then you go into a minimal shoe and your body doesn't know what to do. And that's the thing I, I educate my patients all the time is, you have to gradually step down, just like when you're lifting weights, you have to gradually ramp your weight up. So you might have started in a shoe that has an eight millimeter drop or something like that. And you're going to take it down a couple of millimeters. You can start training in that. Finally, you're down to a zero drop or a minimal shoe and do it over time. Um, one of my favorite ones, you know, zeros makes a great shoe. That's the one I have. Uh, Merrill makes a great minimal shoe. I love training in the Merrills. Um, but the thing is, you kind of have to get your foot there gradually. You can't just go one day from, you know, a Brooks running shoe or something like that into zeros and expect to run, you know, a 5K or, or stand all day and then even. So it's a gradual, just like your body, it's a gradual step down. Awesome. I love that. And it's funny because I, I knew that intuitively, but it's something that I didn't really consciously put mm -hmm. two, two together. That makes a lot of sense. Just like anything, you got to have that gradual approach and for me, I'm always like to people like, oh, just go barefoot. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Like, it's easy. But it's yeah. like when I do it every day for years on end, like, yeah, it's pretty easy for me. And now my foot has that natural shape. But that's, that's interesting. I'm going to have to start recommending people gradually decrease the size of their heel. Yeah, and that's not easy information to find. You know, sometimes they'll have to really look up the shoe you're in and what the drop is on that shoe. And, you know, getting an expert like a physical therapist or someone, a movement specialist to look at your foot mechanics because companies make different types of shoes. You have a, a motion control or support stabilizing shoe. You have a cushion support shoe. You have a neutral shoe. And then you have your drops, right? Your millimeters of drop from the heel to the toe. And so you would, the best step would be one, find a movement expert, P PT or someone that has knowledge in this and they help you through it. Or if you're going to, you know, you don't have that resource on your own, find out how many millimeters the shoe you're wearing is now, and then find a shoe that has a little bit less drop than that. Look at yourself uh, barefoot, stand in the mirror and see what does your arch do? Is it flattened out or is it really high? When you stand on one leg, does your foot cave in towards the big toe or does it go out towards the little toe? That's called pronating with the big toe out to the little toe supinating. And if you're overdoing either one of those, you know, you want to start to work on that to where you keep your foot neutral. You don't have to, even if you have a flat arch, if you're just built that way, but when you stand on one leg and your foot is stable and your ankle's not all wobbly, then you have a stable foot. You have a stable shoe. Then you can start gradually ramping your shoe down over a period of a couple of months. When you're, next, when you're ready for your next pair of shoe, you might go down to the next one down till you're finally at a zero drop. I, I took, honestly, for me to get there, I took about maybe six to eight months uh, going from your traditional running, you know, old school shoe to finally getting in a zero drop footwear. Awesome. 
I love that. And, and so just to kind of come full circle here as we're nearing the end of our uh, 45 minutes we agreed to, what is, what's a place for people to start with just their physical overall health? Let's say they're the average person who sits eight hours a day at a desk and then drives, let's say an hour a day commuting. They're chronically stressed, inflamed. What is something they can do? Because my recommendation is always just start walking. Yes. I would say walk. What is, what is, as a physical therapist, what is your recommendation? Absolutely. I, I would definitely go from, you know, couch, you know, desk chair to walk, a walking program. But the biggest thing that I get in my office too, is that's a great intention, but some people will go and they'll walk two to three miles, six days a week. They'll go for, I'm going to start a walking program. <laughs> and just like we talked about the, the bell curve, they'll do too much of that. Too much of a good thing is bad. So what I always tell my patients is, Pick two or three days a week to walk. Start with 15 to 20 to 30 minutes, depending on your physical health. If you're a pretty fit person, you know, go out and walk for an hour or 30 minutes or something. But on your other days, you know, find a good yoga instructor or find a movement practice of body weight exercises. I mean, there's so many good resources out there now, even with Zoom lessons and Zoom calls. You know, learn a body weight strength. You have to strength train too. So doing things on one leg, standing on one leg. There's a great guy that I, I always reference. His name's Daryl Edwards. And he has a program called Primal Play. And his stance is beautiful. It's like, just get out and play. Get out and move. Go to the park. Try to walk on the rail. You know, try to balance on something. You know, jump off of stuff. Just squat and crawl. It's a very, very practical, almost like return a childlike play as an adult because we lose that. And so that would be a great advice too, is just go out and throw a ball around with your kids or um, one day walk your dog. And then finally, you know, gradually ramp up into something more structured and, and but always include that day of play. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect example, yesterday I was, I was doing some of the Kali. Kali is a Filipino martial arts, use like a bamboo stick, kind of like a nunchuck. And that was part of my workout to end my uh, training session. And then I just started throwing and catching my stick. I don't know where I was resting. And I flipped it once and I caught it. I'm like, let me see if I can flip it twice and catch it. Let me see if I can flip it three times and catch it. And it became this whole like 20 minute session nice. of throwing and catching. And I'm like, wow, this is primal play. I'm, I'm challenging my hand-eye coordination. I'm having fun. I'm pouring in sweat because I just finished my workout and I'm doing something that's fun. That's my big advice is don't forget the fun factor. And I, I think that's why the mace is so cool uh, to kind of bring full circle uh, mace you feel like a, a warrior or a superhero <laughs> or a avenger or something right and, and it takes the a novelty approach to training and for some people that's what they want they don't care about gyms and dumbbells or kettlebells but you give them the mace and they're like wow this is so cool i'm a warrior and the movements are functional and they're great and they're fun but at the same time they're so so health giving beautiful i love it and that's something i love going in the woods for what you said i like walking on fallen trees of like going on the different trails, jumping rock to rock. And fun is an important yeah. part of our life that we've forgotten. So I'm glad that that's the message you left home. So everyone listening, go have some fun, go play, be a kid have again, fun. enjoy <laughs> the sunshine, enjoy the nature, get out there, do something different, do something fun. So Dr. Joey, thank you for being here. What is the best place for people to reach you? How can they get a hold of you? How can they get involved in your course and, Get there, get your wooden mace. Great. Uh, Instagram is probably my most active social media platform. So uh, Dr. Joey PT is my Instagram profile. That's the one that I really, you know, launch a lot of things on. And from there, you can connect into my Primal Flow Instagram as well. I'm always updating, you know, we have a new course coming up or I, I put free, you know, videos, sample workouts. I train all the time and I shoot little video clips to see, to just show people some ideas of ways to train. So Dr. Joey PT on Instagram is a good one. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Looking forward to doing my final exam with you on our foundations course together very soon. So again, thank you for being here. Have a great day and uh, we'll talk very soon, my friend. You too. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of the Whole Health of Rob Carney podcast with our guest, Dr. Joey Cadena. So you can find uh, Dr. Joey on Instagram at Dr. Joey PT. That's D-R Joey, the letter P, letter T on Instagram. And I highly, highly, highly recommend, as we talked about throughout this podcast, check out his Primal Flow Warrior Mace, both the Foundations course and the Wooden Mace itself. 
I can assure you, if you like movement, if you like playing, if you like enjoying your workouts, enjoying your movement, you're going to enjoy this course. You're going to enjoy these maces that he works with and he is a true professional he is truly a master of his skill and i've been so fortunate to get to know him as a person and as a teacher and really learn from him throughout this journey of me learning the mace myself and as always you can learn more about him again dr joey pt on instagram and this podcast is also supported by our superfoods so the purium superfoods all the green juices the beet juices the pre-digested vegan amino acids, the biomedic to help remove glyphosate and restore the gut, super probiotic, all of that, all those products, so white American ginseng, these are all great products I've been taking for over a year now, and I can say they've fundamentally changed my life. As someone who is really involved with health and nutrition, this is not only a convenient way to get high quality nutrition into our body, but it's also the best quality is really what it comes down to. This is a company who's focused on creating top quality products to really focus on healing the people and healing the planet. Most of these foods are grown north of Salt Lake City in Utah, about four hours or so north, where there's no pesticide residue, no toxicity. It's basically the middle of nowhere, Utah. So it's coming from volcanic ash beds is really where they source um, a lot of the ground from. So that's where they're being grown. So it's got some really solid soil really caring owners at the heart and there will be the first company to be plastic free by 2021 so we'd love for you to check those out you can go to ishoppurium.com and use the code whole health to save fifty dollars or 25 percent on your first order and if you're interested in joining the superfood business with purium rob and the rest of the holistic justice league here that we got going on shoot me a message at whole health connections all one word on instagram would love to chat about the business opportunity And we also have Mushroom Revival uh, for all your mushroom needs. So reishi, lion's mane, cordyceps, all these powerful adaptogens. You can get those at mushroom-revival.com and use the code WHOLEHEALTH to save 15% on your every order. And one of my most recent sponsors and partners in terms of business has been Aries Tech. So as I mentioned before in previous podcasts, we are surrounded by non-native EMF. So we, as human beings, are electro electromagnetic frequency emitting beings so we have an electromagnetic frequency just like plants do rocks do soil does animals do but those are all native and when we come in contact with non-native electromagnetic frequencies such as computers cell phones laptops um, wi-fi 4g 5g cell towers all these things that are non-native electromagnetic frequencies they are disrupting our native electromagnetic frequency. So essentially what Aries Tech does is it's a way to transform a lot of these non-native frequencies into a way that our body can more easily digest and it's not going to really cause havoc and stress at a cellular level to our body. So you can go to AriesTech.com, use the code WHOLEHEALTH to save 10% on your orders. And those are the three groups I'm working with. Really would love for you to check all those out. Start with Perium, work down the line, depending on what your needs are. Let me know. I'm more than happy to help. And of course, check out Dr. Joey at Dr. Joey PT. Get his Primal Flow Mace. Get into his course. You're not going to regret it. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Wishing you health, happiness, love, and success in all your ventures. Thank you for listening.